um, transformation in the products and services that we create and indeed the very way in which we create them. So over the next 15 minutes or so, I'll share some insights, I'll present some general reflections, and then I'll dive into a few examples. I hope you enjoy the talk. familiar with BA Systems, I present just a few facts and, and figures. As a systems integrator, our proposition is that we underpin the performance, the safety, the cost, and the schedule delivery of some of the most complex systems in the world today. And to do this, we work with a really diverse range of partners and suppliers, including over 150 universities worldwide. We consider ourselves the custodian of some national skills in the UK. And the impact that technology is having on that skill base and those partnerships is extremely important to us. And it's a point that I'll come back to at the end. You can see BA Systems has a proud heritage uh, of, of working in India with the Indian Defence Forces and particularly with the Indian Air Force to deliver capability. And in the way that each of these systems brought new capability and new technology to meet an operational need in, in its own way, the question that we ask now is what's next? What are the drivers that will define the next generation of products and services? And how do we respond to some of the challenges that we see around us today? Well, the first thing that is very apparent is that the old ways are gone. The days of black and white requirements and a predictable world order are over. Political, legal, economic and societal norms are changing. The approaches that our adversaries are prepared to employ with sub-threshold warfare, deep fakes, unconventional tactics, weaponization of social media, perhaps best exemplified with recent activity in the US, drives the need for a new approach. Technology is de developing at a blistering rate. The rapid maturation of the fourth industrial revolution technologies such as cloud, cyber, Internet of Things, big data, simulation, AI, are being fueled by an eye-watering level of investment from the tech giants, and it's sweeping incredible change through all industries. In a recent report from PwC, they noted that Amazon's investment in R&D last year was more than the total global investment in defence R&D. So that just gives you a sense of scale. And this change is causing shockwaves through defence. So General Sir Nick Carter, Chief of Defence Staff in the UK, identified Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, you're good. Yeah. Okay. She has signaled a complete overhaul of the MOD's science and technology agenda and the laboratory portfolio in the next five years. And indeed, in India, we've seen a similar call to action. Army Chief General Nathan encouraged the nation's armed forces to place more emphasis on the available disruptive technologies that have dual use and are being driven by this commercial investment. And indeed, Vision 2030 and Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Badoria, emphasised the need for that rapid capacity building, and dedicated work to, towards effective integration of new technology in the shortest possible time frame, noting the importance of the changing nature of threats in this sort of rapidly changing world. And organizations like Amazon, like Google, like Microsoft now play a potentially critical role in this agenda. And the new normal is this technology chain reaction with these new advances that are fueling innovations across all sectors. So what we see in front of us is a disaggregated hybrid solution space. Operationally, we envisage a diverse landscape of digital, cyber-enabled, connected, disaggregated, data-driven assets and actors exerting will through sub-threshold, 
kinetic or non-kinetic effect, targeting everything from infrastructure, information systems, people. Every domain from space to underwater, cyber and information is a potential frontier of conflict. Aircraft, complex directed energy, weapons, and counter systems, multi domain operations, agile command and control, networks, and cognitive sensors are all part of this mix. And AI enabled systems able to process massive amounts of data at incredible speed will be key to this future. And of course, quantum technology in its multiple forms promises an absolutely phenomenal the accurate, resilient navigation, eye-watering and fast computation, uh, enabling complex calculations that can enable rapid material discovery, rapid qualification potentially, faster than real-time modeling and manufacture, new approaches to code cracking. It's, it's just such a massive, massive change in our environment. So there's absolutely lots and lots to go at but I'd like to just present feet on the ground. So the systems integrator has to bring together weight, effect, data, cost and schedule, security, all into a single proposition. So just considering the data challenge that we face in the fast jet world, here's a, here's a graphic from the, from the Typhoon team, and it illustrates the sort of explosion in data that we're dealing with. Today, Typhoon gathers gigabytes of data on a typical mission. But with the e-scan radar, this will ratchet up to petabytes almost overnight. And in the future battle space environment we've just been envisaging, we'll be in this exabyte territory. This is an absolutely phenomenal explosion in data. So how, how do we wrap our heads around that, that massive on the, the Tempest team. It, it's already really challenging for in-service products, but for new products on the drawing board, it's also a really challenging environment. The Team Tempest is a collaboration with UK MOD and industry, and the future combat air system will be a system of systems, but it will need to be flexible, manned or unmanned, upgradable, capable, affordable and connected and cooperative. But if I look at the charts on the left hand side, the first chart at the top there shows the relationship between unit price of a combat aircraft and their year of introduction. It's, it's Augustine's law, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. And it basically says there's an order of magnitude increase in the unit cost of fast jets every couple of decades. And I think Augustine even predicted that by the 2050s, the US defense budget would have... It's, oh. it's, um, it's, it's clear that systems that we introduce need to be compelling, not just for the adversary, but for the taxpayer as well. So we need to break... The, the number of soft... Dr. Tom that in the F4 Phantom, about 10% of its capability was derived from software. Of lines of code. So we need to find a way to, to break this escalation in cost and complexity of the overall systems in order to field systems that are affordable and compelling. So the first area by, by simulation and data analytics. Our customers are in a world in which military operational concepts and tactics Rapid response. 
sir you could just ask her to switch off her video yeah uh, i think so but uh, her presentation would still be required so she can put off yeah, her the... can uh, put off your video let the presentation carry on but we can hear you but right now we can't hear you the uh, quality of uh, you know the data connection is not very good ah right what would you like me to do no uh, see you can use maybe the video part and we can listen to you uh, uh, you know got just just switch off your video yeah okay do you want you want me to okay hang on a second uh just a moment Okay, it's okay now, so maybe she can try. Good. Uh, we can uh, take another chance. Please uh, start again. Yes. From here, you carry on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we we're, we're talking about being able to model the complete system and and all of its system components, and that digital twin environment that we sort of uh, demonstrate on the left hand side there goes right the way through from the concept part of the life cycle and into the support and the training environment. And simulation and analytics is providing completely new ways to design systems, new ways to train for systems. And it brings that partnership through the life cycle with customers, um, with suppliers, right to the center of what we do. significant change that is coming and it allows us to embrace massive computational power and the data and analytics and it, it provides a complete step change in how we will design build and certify some of these complex systems that we've been talking about The next area for us to consider is AI and autonomy. So AI in its myriad of different forms is creating really new paradigms. And we are seeing new opportunities through this machine to machine learning. I think Director General NATO recently was quoted as saying that AI was the single most important area in which nations must collaborate. And so there's that interesting balance between human intelligence and machine intelligence that we're seeing. And again, AI is like software. It's pervasive. It goes right the way through the life cycle from, from concept development through to designs, into development, manufacturing, into operation. And it offers completely new ways of configuring systems. In order to realize that vision, we will need trust, trust in those systems. We're starting to see AI and autonomy appear in our daily lives. But in order to create those swarms of systems and that sort of swarms of different unmanned or optionally manned and unmanned fleets of vehicle systems, we need trust. We need to know that we can certificate systems and that they will perform in the right way. So again, we have a really active program of research reaching into our university collaborations that is investigating trust in autonomous systems, different architectural approaches, so that we can bring in the... ...to enable some of transformative... Uh, somewhere within this network okay so the kind of interfaces that we now see augmented reality virtual reality mixed reality are really important and they enable us to make sense of these vast amounts of data so we see a configuration on the left hand side there where computing machine learning takes us to a new place our relationship with machines and software is changing. 
we can see a future control center here with AI agents, avatars dynamically supporting that mission planning process with remote collaboration and virtual co-location becoming a, a way of working in the future. Cues such as natural voice, eye tracking, haptics, all get incorporated into, into systems with psychophysiological monitoring to understand stress levels, overload um, of the human in that loop. To talk specifically about the cockpit, many of today's cockpit environments are a complex array of, of controls, menus, interfaces within interfaces, and are becoming an increasingly limiting factor in a human being able to understand the vast amounts of data presented, but also to affordability. So our future concept is a multi-mode software reconfigurable co cockpit that is customizable and allows the pilot to be mission commander of a fleet of potentially unmanned systems. We will have meta systems that allow autonomous agent to work with the, the cockpit with the human operator so that the machine can dial up or dial down the level of machine processing and autonomy dependent Uh, I think we've lost uh, the lights. We will just wait for a few more seconds. Normally, she comes back. <laughs> yeah. I see she, something is happening there. Uh, Ian, are you there? Ian? Ian Draper? Uh, group Ian Draper, are you there? Her screen gets unshared. We can't... Uh... And the Adam... And do, do it, Rohit. Can you uh, share the screen? Then I'll speak for a few seconds till she comes back. The unshare ka option nahi hai, but expel karne ka option hai. Uh, she may come back. So uh, what I'll do is I will uh, very briefly cover what she has uh, covered till now. Uh, basically, she's mentioned about the BA systems, and uh, they, they are undoubtedly, we all know, a leading uh, uh, aerospace company in the world. And they have had the huge uh, presence uh, right from the Vampire to the NAT to Jaguar and, uh, uh, and the current, current system. We all know Hawk and other aircraft. But the main theme of her talk till now has been on disruption of uh, technologies. And uh, we all know that the world is going into the fourth uh, generation uh, industrial revolution. And uh, uh, the scale is, uh, uh, you know, a multifold, uh, this uh, fourth industrial revolution. Uh, she talked about the, uh, the high speed uh, data and how huge uh, data has to be handled uh, uh, simultaneously. And uh, the quantum of data, uh, you know, practically one... Uh, uh, terabyte uh, per sortie, which uh, will uh, in future go to gettabyte. Uh, uh, so that is the kind of you know, figures she has mentioned. And she talked about the uh, Tempest uh, program. Uh, the costs of aircraft are shooting up, we all know. They are becoming, uh, uh, aircraft becoming less affordable even to the rich countries like America. So uh, th that's an issue that uh, the new te technology is going to help uh, uh, factor in by doing parallel processing, whether it's through cloud computing or through other uh, means. And therefore, uh, she mentioned that uh, how uh, the uh, technology disruption uh, is uh, taking place uh, to make uh, things a little more affordable. 
And then, of course, he spoke about uh, AI and uh, autonomy and the need for all of us to trust the AI and to uh, build up our trust in autonomous systems, uh, which will be standalone, which will take their own decisions. And uh, also uh, the need for human uh, machine interface, which is um, uh, which is going to be important, especially when we have to, as we saw in the Aero India recently, uh, the cats where the LCA is going to uh, be able to uh, control oh, so the, the issue. Back. Okay, yeah. I stood in uh, your place and I uh, repeated whatever you had said till now. And now back to you. Uh, you, were, you were on the slide of disruptive technologies. You were on the slide of disruptive technologies. Had I done manufacturing? No, this you, one? you were disruptive technologies. That particular slide. Pilot handling multiple platforms. You were there. You were talking about pilot handling multiple platforms. Ah, so right. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank yes. you so much. I'm sorry about the connection issues. Apologies. Yeah, so um, so we need to create um, environments in which our pilot or the commander that might be commanding a fleet of different vehicles, manned and unmanned, can, can uh, utilise their decision making at the right moment. So this massive data deluge will need to be handled uh, by a cooperation between the pilot commander and an avatar, an onboard autonomous agent, machine intelligence that can process that data. And we envisage a future in which we can dial up or dial down the level of processing that is undertaken by the machine so that in high stress environments, the machine can take on more of the processing and, the, and can also identify when the human is disengaged, when, when tasks are monotonous. So we see a range of different multimodal configurations that will enable this new paradigm in the cockpit. Similarly, in the factory of the future environment, we have a vision of a completely digitally enabled factory with humans working alongside cobots that will enable efficiencies and affordability, will take away the repetitive tasks that are currently inefficiently undertaken by humans. And it will allow us to create those, to generate those systems that have been worked up in that environment with the customer, that have been analyzed, that have quickly gone through into the design environment and quickly gone through into the build environment massively reducing the time it takes to go from design through to build and into the operation. We're exploring a whole range of different techniques and approaches. So additive layer manufacturing is allowing us to build designs that cannot be built <coughs> with conventional means. <coughs> so using, so using artificial, artificial intelligence, intelligence optimized design, design allows us to now create new designs with additive layer manufacturing. And we're looking for new materials, materials that can help signature control, that can help thermal, thermal control, materials that have nanotechnology, hybridization, biomimetic uh, types of materials, multifunctional materials, all now come into this space of the factory of the future with massively reduced development cycles. My final slide then is to really just emphasize, emphasize how important those global partnerships are across the defense sector with industrial players and with our academic partners. It's absolutely fundamental that we seek new partnerships, not just with the traditional players, but also with novel entrants, small, medium-sized enterprise. We work with gaming industries, we work with Formula One teams so that we can access the very latest technology. That collaboration needs to happen across the ecosystem. Indeed, Prime Minister Johnson is visiting India later this year and Prime Minister Modi, I hope, will be coming to the G7 summit in Cornwall later this summer 
which emphasizes the need for that global collaboration. And education is, is critical uh, as part of that agenda, as well as inclusivity, diversity is, is fundamental. So in conclusion, the pace of technology is one of our most challenging problems, but the most exciting opportunity. It's a generational opportunity for transformation. And we welcome this new era. Look forward to the new collaborations and partnerships that will, will enable success. I thank you for your attention. And I'm so sorry about the connection issues that we've been dealing with. Thank you, Julia. I must tell you that uh, we did not miss anything. Uh, because uh, when you were not there, I tried to cover up and uh, uh, became part of the BAE system for a few minutes. So uh, very interesting, very enriching. And uh, uh, in addition, in the last few uh, minutes, uh, Julia told us uh, how, the, how to improve human efficiency by uh, multiple parallel processing and competition, which the computers uh, and other systems can uh, help the human being adaptive designs is another thing she spoke about and the new materials uh, using nanotechnologies and lastly and very very importantly she mentioned to us the need for uh, global partnerships uh, because it's uh, not possible for a single country or single company to be able to handle uh, such futuristic technologies because there's a mesh of a large number of technologies some of which she spoke so what we are going to do is we will have the questions and the answers only at the end. I'm now going to introduce my uh, second speaker for this uh, uh, session. And that is Mr. Conrad Banks, who has been there on the screen for quite some time, Chief Engineer, Defense Future Programs, Rolls-Royce. In uh, this role, he is responsible for identifying and delivering new power and propulsion system concepts to meet the future military aerospace market requirements. These indeed military platforms, platforms all sectors of and and propulsion and propulsion, but focus on future on future combat. His early career was spent developing his core skills in engine performance and controls. Having graduated with a BE in Aeronautical Engineering from Bristol University. He has worked at Rolls-Royce for 30 years and has been in UK throughout. Unlucky guy. So he never got a chance to serve in Australia like Julia did. But to his current role, he was the Chief Engineer for Defense Technology Programs. He was the Chief Performance and Controls Engineer on the Pegasus engine, which is uh, we all know was in Harrier and EG, EJ200 engine, which is on Typhoon. Uh, Conrad is a chartered engineer and a fellow of Royal Aeronautical Society, where since 2005, he has been the chairman for the Bristol branch. Notable achievements over recent years include uh, the technical leadership of propulsion team for the highly successful and advanced Taranis unmanned combat aircraft uh, recognized with the prestigious Royal Aeronautical Society Team Silver Medal in 2014. From 2018, he has become the Propulsion and Power Systems Chief Engineer for the UK-led Tempest Future Combat Program. Practically, is part of all the future programs that the that UK is running. Uh, he is going to speak to us on the digital more electric and sustainable future military power. Over to you, Andra. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, any yes. problems, please uh, please shout or, or raise your, your hands. Um, Could you it, go first, It's please? a pleasure. Yes, I will. Um, there we go. Is that coming through fine? Yes. It's awesome. Fantastic. Um, yes, Mr. Demonstrating's guest, it, it's an honor to be back at this very prestigious event. I think this is the third or fourth time I've had the pleasure of supporting Jumbo Machinda. And um, it's always one of my highlights. It's just so disappointing I'm not there with you in person. 
please invite me back next time and I will be able to correct that and it will give me great pleasure to actually present in, in person. So um, this theme uh, of this session, as you have said, is the March of Technology. Um, and there's three areas I would like to talk through. Apologies. Um, just see my screen. Uh, there we go. Uh, three areas. So the first one, and this is how technology is going to really transform our capability from a power and propulsion perspective. The first is digital, um, and that will resonate with quite a few of the themes that Julia has just talked about, but from a power and propulsion perspective. So how digital is really changing our industry from the design through the development, the testing, right through into in-service support. The second area I'm going to touch on is the more electric future. Um, and we are seeing electrification transforming future capability across all sectors, um, from small electric UAVs right up to future combat aircraft. They're going to benefit from more hybridized and more electric systems, uh, as well as, and this is where the, the bottom issue comes in, sustainable future, potentially powered by synthetic fuel that is manufactured using small modular nuclear reactors. Um, so we have a truly sustainable future um, that's potentially more capable as well. So these are the three areas that I'm, I'm going to talk through, um, and hopefully you will be stimulated by uh, the technologies on show. So. Let me start with, uh, with digital. And if you walk through the design offices of Rolls-Royce today, they are completely different to the past. We had the era of the, uh, of the drawing board, and, uh, and then we moved to computer-aided design. But now when you walk through the corridors of Rolls-Royce, you see a lot of people pinching the air seemingly randomly plucking things out of the air whilst they are wearing 3D goggles. And this development and design in a digital environment is now really transforming capabilities. We are literally immersing ourselves in the 3D rendition, life size of components. Um, and this is a very, very powerful tool to design the next generation of products. Um, not only is it for the designers, but we're bringing in the repair and oval engineers who are going to have to assemble these products, and they can actually simulate all of this work in this virtual, immersive 3D environment. Uh, we can develop designs that have never previously been possible, uh, and it's a very, very powerful tool that's really transforming uh, the way that we're designing new products. So this is this is just the start, and you can see some some graphics on the screen. You know, th these are real images of how we're taking the design of the future power systems going forward. It's not just the design that's benefiting from, from digital, it's the analysis that goes with it. And this is really resonating what Judah has talked about with the power of computing. Um, I remember when I was at university, albeit a long time ago, and uh, my lecturer said, you know, if we're going to do full Navier-Stokes computational fluid dynamics calculations, it would need every computer in the world three months to fully uh, develop and, and resolve all of the equations. Now, those same equations can be done by one supercomputer overnight. The orders of magnitude of computer power have gone up immeasurably. It's almost unfathomable how much more powerful computing is now. So although CFD is nothing new, the power of the computational pure dynamic tools are so much more. But the significant thing here is how these tools are all linked together. And this is the concept of model-based systems engineering. Previously, you'd have uh, a team of designers uh, designing a new com compressor, for example. And in the next door office, a team is designing a very advanced new turbine. And they use these tools to optimize the design of these components. But when they're put together, they don't work in a system in the most effective way. Now, when we are developing power systems of the future, every area of computational analysis is linked to the other through model-based systems engineering. So if a designer in a combustion chamber makes a change, it immediately updates the system and the knock-on effects to all the other components are changed real time. So that means that as we're developing the product, step by step, 
we are always optimizing the end result. We are always optimizing those trade studies. And this linking of the very powerful computational tools enables us to do things right first time. It enables us to rapidly uh, optimize and resolve what had been previously too difficult, even for the computers of recent years. So we are seeing such a benefit, and we really are leveraging the power of computing and the model-based systems engineering that's enabled us to couple all of these design tools. And then we come on to testing. One of the reasons that developing gas turbines and power systems has been so difficult and so expensive is the time it takes to prove and test these very expensive complex machines. Now, the images at the bottom is a test that's required for airworthiness requirements. This is a fan blade off test where we actually effectively blow up a gas turbine to prove the containment system of the fan blade. Uh, it costs multiple millions of pounds and the whole test itself can take several months to plan and deliver. Such is the power of our computer simulations now that our um, computers can replicate that test very, very accurately. And we are working with the authorities to show that the simulations, the testing, design and validate in the computer environment, that that is so robust and so reliable that in the future we won't have to do the tests that have previously done before. We can basically validate our products in a computational environment. That is extremely transformational. We can develop gas turbines so much quicker. We can demonstrate their efficacy so much quicker and the cost will be greatly reduced. Now, you can't do this overnight. The airworthiness authorities aren't gonna accept a future gas turbine that's never been over a test bed. But the more that we validate the tool sets, the more that we have confidence in the tool sets, the more the powerful computers augment those tests, the better and the closer we are to that utopian vision. And we are already seeing now, when we are developing um, the Tempest program, previous tests are now being done and validated in a computer environment. And that transition is gonna continue. And that really will transform the ability to bring new products to market quickly and at lower cost. And finally, on digital, before I move on to the next section, and this is, was talked about very effectively by Julia earlier, is the whole concept of a digital twin. Now, exactly as Julia said, we are looking at replicating all parts of the life cycle. So we have digital twins, digital renditions, digital representations of, for example, the factory. So every part, every bit of inventory is mirrored digitally. It enables very, very optimum uh, control of inventory, uh, how we do the flow line of the products. Nothing is unknown. It's all exactly digitally rendered. And then when we come to the products themselves, we have a, a digital twin of every single product that is manufactured, right down to the individual torques that the operator did the, uh, the various bolts and nuts up. That's all stored with the digital twin of that gas turbine every tolerance, where the parts are within the, um, the tolerance band, that is all stored exactly in the digital twin. So that when we go in service, we go in service with an engine, and alongside it, we have a digital twin of an exact replica of that engine. So if we want to introduce a modification, we introduce the modification on the digital twin first and prove that it's gonna be successful. If we have an in-service event, we know immediately is that uh, going to be a risk to the rest of the fleet? Was the engine in question towards when under the tolerance band or not? We have all of that information to hand. Um, again, it's going to transform our capabilities to develop products and then to support products and service, all because of the power of data. Let me change tack now. Uh, and this is another area where technology, the march of technology is really transforming the industry and that is electric, more electric. Now, um, I say the civil sector has been leading the way. It's actually the automotive industry that's been leading the way. If you, if you go on the roads today, there's all electric cars, there's Teslas, 
Uh, I've got a hybrid car, uh, which is partly electric, partly um, petrol. The aerospace industry has, has challenges because we have to fly these uh, potentially quite large and heavy electrical systems. But then, nevertheless, we are seeing the emergence of electric uh, products. Um, now, in the, in, the, in the small arena, um, so small UAVs potentially, up to 250 kilograms, it's perfectly viable to have fully electric military EV tolls. So these are, are battery-powered, um, small UAVs, even manned uh, military EV tolls um, that are going to um, add great capability. As we go up in size, it's not feasible, and I'll show you why in a minute, it's not feasible to have all electric power systems. The physics is against us. But we can introduce hybrid electric, which combines electrical systems and gas turbines. And be it a large transport aircraft, be it a future helicopter, be it a large UAV or a loyal wingman, you still have the gas turbine at the heart because you need the, back, the, the power density of the gas turbine. But that gas turbine isn't driving a propeller. That gas turbine isn't propelling jet thrust out of the back. That gas turbine is driving a generator. And that generator is powering uh, distributed fans across the vehicle. It's powering all different systems on the aircraft. The beauty here is that the gas turbine is operating at peak efficiency the whole time. And when you need more power for takeoff and climb, you drain the energy storage device to augment the power. And when you are cruising or descending, you are charging up the power source. Because the gas turbine is always operating at peak efficiency, across a mission, you get a very significant saving. Because DAF gas turbines off design are very inefficient. Uh, the amount of wasted fuel when you are descending an aircraft or when you're cruising is quite significant. So hybrid electric is really going to make a difference. What about future combat? Future combat is all about power density. Uh, you haven't got the luxury of putting very, very large uh, distributed propulsion systems in hybrid electric. You need the thrust away. You need that military capability. Is it realistic to move to an all-electric future for, for future combat? Well, this is the, uh, this is the physics slide, um, and this will explain, and, and I've shown similar things in the past. But this shows the real challenge we have of transforming our industry from gas turbine to alternative power sources. And it's all down to the power density and the engine energy density challenge. Um, on the left-hand side, on the y-axis, we have the power density. So this, if you like, is the instantaneous power you can get. Uh, and on the x-axis, you have the energy density, which is the duration that you can provide the energy, if you like, the, the endurance, the range. The problem we have with batteries is they're at least an order of magnitude less in terms of power density and energy density from a gas turbine. Even very high discharge rate batteries, high C rate batteries, you can move a little bit up the Y axis, but you have very, very minimal energy density. Uh, to get the power you need, you're basically draining the batteries in very few minutes, which is why the EV tolls today and the all electric aircraft are still quite limited uh, in terms of their endurance, because you have to have a high discharge rate to get the power. So we have this 10, 20 fold difference in power and energy density between batteries and gas turbines. Hybrid systems uh, can make the, the equation more efficient, as I've talked about, but they're still not applicable for um, future gas turbines, for future combat systems. People also talk about hydrogen. Hydrogen in itself is a very power dense fuel. The problem is the storage of hydrogen is a problem. Um, as you can see bottom left, for one kilogram of hydrogen fuel, you need about an 18 kilogram tank. And for a future combat platform, it's just not realistic to have a huge heavy tank of hydrogen fuel. Maybe for some long endurance UAVs, maybe for some transport aircraft, but not for combat aircraft. Uh, the same with uh, hydrogen fuel cells. To illustrate this, and this is one chart I have shown before, if we were to re-engine the Eurofighter Typhoon with an all-electric propulsion system, it would look like this. To replicate the power density and the energy density, to have a mission that flies for 
an hour, an hour and a half with the power requirement from a typhoon, you would need a 20 ton battery that is the size of the aircraft. Completely unviable. Not to mention the fact that there's no weight saving as you discharge the battery. At least with, with fuel, you're progressively getting lighter and you can, you can gear that into the benefit of the, of, the, of the flight system. So we have a huge challenge transitioning combat to all electric. So what are we going to do? Well, we are going to embrace more electric in future combat. And we're doing this already with the Tempest program. Um, there will be gas turbines at the heart. As you've seen, for energy density reasons and power density reasons, it's essential that there's an advanced gas turbine propelling future combat platforms where power density is key. But we are now going to embrace electrical energy to power all of the avionic systems on the aircraft, to power directed energy weapon systems, uh, to power the electrically actuated uh, flaps, control systems, ailerons, uh, the electrically deployed undercarriage. This aircraft is going to be more electric. And although we are providing gas turbines, those gas turbines are simultaneously going to generate in the megawatt class of electrical energy to power all of these systems. So I talk about the future propulsion system being an integrated power system. This is an advanced gas turbine that happens to be a flying power station generating a megawatt of electricity. And at the same time, it's, 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 a, it's a flying a thermal management system that's going to cool all the systems down on the aircraft. And this is how we are doing it. Um, we are embedding uh, very powerful permanent magnets onto the shaft of the gas turbines. Now, these shafts of the gas turbine are rotating um, 15,000 RPM. 15,000 revs per minute. These very advanced permanent magnets are fused to the shafts of the engine. You can see we have one on the LP shaft and the one on the HP shaft. So as the gas turbine spool rotates at 15,000 RPM, we are generating very, very power dense, high levels of electrical energy. And those electrical energy is distributed around the whole aircraft. But it works in other directions. If you want to start the engine, you reverse the polarity and you inload and you actually energize the spools by uh, linking the, the spools to batteries. So on the ground, you press a button and you just energize the spool. As you are, are flying the aircraft, if you're worried about stability margin, you're, you're operating in, in top left of the flight envelope and you want to pull lots of maneuvers, again, you can inload the shafts and buy back surge margin. You can move electrical energy from the LP generator to the HP generator, and you can match energy within the whole gas turbine to optimize performance throughout the engine. Um, this is for real. We have tested this capability already. Uh, we have demonstrated optimized start. Uh, we can energize the spools to differentiating degrees uh, to accelerate the, the, the shaft speed or not. Every part of the flight envelope, we can potentially start the gas turbine. Uh, we've demonstrated a significant improvement in efficiency by harmonizing this relationship between mechanical and electrical. And this really is going to transform future combat and the future combat systems where we need directed energy weapons. So the scenario here is that you start the engine through the battery uh, and, and you take off. And the whole time that you're flying out to theater, those LP and HP generators are constantly charging up storage devices on the aircraft so that you can discharge massive peaks of electrical energy through directed energy weapons. And then you go back to harvesting and, and, and charging cycles, all done using intelligent systems, all done doing intelligent power management. It's a very exciting change to what's traditionally been mechanical gas turbines. This is now the harmony of electrical and mechanical. The last area I want to talk about is sustainability. And wherever you are in the aerospace industry at the moment, the question is asked, is true zero capable? Can we have a zero emission future? If not zero emission, can we have a net zero so that all of the, all of the CO2 produced has originally been captured from the atmosphere and we have a net environment? 
is it realistic for future combat, which is all about power and performance, to embrace sustainability, or is this simply a challenge for the civil and automotive industry? Well, it's not. There is a win-win opportunity for sustainability. And I'm going to talk about that on the last time. J just to clarify the definitions, because you hear sustainable aviation fuel, synthetic aviation fuel, true zero, net zero. True zero is when we talk about zero emissions. So this would be a battery or solar powered vehicle. And as you have seen, that's only realistic for very small, short endurance products, small EV tolls, um, small solar powered UAVs. They are the only truly zero emissions. We're looking at zero carbon emissions by burning hydrogen, uh, direct hydrogen in gas turbines and also hydrogen fuel cells for high altitude pseudo cell satellites. Uh, we're looking at using ammonia fuel. Now these don't produce carbon, but they produce other emissions, water vapor. And if you're putting lots of water vapor into the high altitude, um, that will affect climate. Uh, NOx, nitrous oxide, is another emission that needs to be concerned about. And that's a real issue when we're burning ammonia fuel. So yes, true zero is possible for small EV tolls. Zero carbon is being looked at for a number of vehicles. For future combat, we're looking at net zero. And this is using hydrocarbon fuel. The aircraft, the engine itself, doesn't actually know that the fuel is any different to the fossil fuel that we have today. The difference is that the carbon atoms that make up that hydrocarbon fuel didn't start their life buried underground in fossil fuel. They started their life in the atmosphere. And those carbon atoms were either captured by, by plants um, in the manufacture of biofuels, or they are captured in air uh, using carbon capture processes combined with hydrogen atoms and the creation of synthetic aviation fuel. And this is what we mean by net zero. And it's all about the life cycle of the carbon atoms. We are not going to move away from gas turbines and hydrocarbon fuels for future combat. Nothing replicates the power density, but we can embrace a sustainable future with net zero. And this is my last slide, and I'll spend a couple of minutes just explaining this, because I think this is, this is really, this is the vision we have within Rolls-Royce. Um, and I think this is uh, a win-win game changer. And this is all about the manufacture of synthetic aviation fuel. Synthetic aviation fuel is hydrocarbon fuel. It has the same power density. In fact, we can actually create it with an elevated calorific value from traditional fossil-based fuel. So this will actually give a boost in performance to future aircraft because we're manufacturing optimum fuels and systems. How can we manufacture hydrocarbon fuel without using any CO2? And this is where the small modular reactors come in, which Rolls-Royce um, are part of a consortium in the UK, and we see this being a very exciting future. Obviously, small modular reactors are nuclear power, so that in definition is carbon free. And the small modular reactors power the electrical energy to capture the CO2 from air. They power the hydrolysis of water to, to create green hydrogen. Green hydrogen, CO2 captured from air at an elevated pressure and temperature with a catalyst, with electrical energy, again from the small modular reactor, via a fischer trop process, creates synthetic aviation fuel. At all stages of the process, we have used nuclear energy, air, water, and we create synthetic aviation fuel at the end. Carbon-free manufacture via nuclear and a carbon-neutral life cycle. The CO2 atoms start in the atmosphere. They're captured by the atmosphere. They combine with hydrogen, which is removed from water. And then when that fuel is burnt in the aircraft, the carbon dioxide atoms, the carbon atoms are returned to the atmosphere. It is a net neutral process. So if we look on the right-hand side, and we look at all the different types of future military propulsion. Everything has a sustainable future. The small EV tolls, the small all battery powered military vehicles 
Those batteries are powered from the grid, and the grid is supplied from a small modular reactor. The manufacture of green hydrogen, which is basically water electrolysis, extracting the, the hydrogen from water, powered again by the same nuclear process, provides green hydrogen that can provide hydrogen fuel cells for high altitude pseudo satellites and potential UAVs. And then when we need the gas turbine for future combat, for future UAV, for future transport, either as direct propulsion or hydroelectric, we're using synthetic aviation fuel, where every part of that fuel has been captured from air, from water, is combined using electrical energy from a sustainable source. And that is a truly sustainable future. We even have the ability to make green ammonia um, by extracting the nitrogen from the air and combining that with um, energy um, in um, water, H2, that's literally as water from the Harbour Bosch process. Um, this is a very exciting future. Carbon free manufacture, carbon use and life cycle. The product itself, the future combat aircraft, is potentially more capable using a higher calorific fuel and the whole process is carbon neutral. So that is my time. That is the future for technology. We are going to embrace digital. We're going to embrace electrical. And we have a sustainable future that is a true win-win. Advanced military capability and doing a huge bit for the environment and sustainability. So thank you very much for, for all your time and your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Very, very educating, very, very enlightening. And I must tell you three key words that you used again and again, digital, electrical, and sustainable. And so beautifully you explained to us how the design itself stage, the digital visualization and the 3D uh, computational fluid dynamics, and the, how you explain that uh, Perhaps we won't require destructive testing anymore because uh, uh, the virtual engine testing will allow us uh, uh, time reduction, cost reduction, and of course we will have to get the certification authorities on board. The uh, uh, digital control of the inventories and the digital twin uh, uh, of the actual engine uh, that that will help you save uh, you know great amount of time. It, uh, other things you sp spoke about was the uh, electric uh, systems and the limitations as of today, very good for small <clears throat> UAVs, uh, small VTOL uh, type of uh, aircraft, but uh, not good enough for uh, larger aeroplanes. But the ca overall capacity to generate uh, power on board is uh, going up. The storage on board is going up, and uh, that is uh, uh, going to help uh, uh, bring in more and more such functions in larger aeroplanes. Uh, maybe the hydraulics will go, the control systems are already op operating electrically. Many, many other systems will go uh, electrical. Uh, that will uh, greatly save the weight. And then, uh, uh, of course, uh, of the uh, hydro uh, hydrogen fuel cells you spoke about and how uh, some amount of hybrid system will have to remain in fighters for uh, quite some time to come because the kind of uh, you know thrust weight uh, that you uh, uh, want to generate cannot be done by electrical systems and uh, and lastly you talked about the emissions uh, the issues are related to uh, whether we can get to net zero and how do we get biofuels synthetic fuels uh, combinations of electrical and synthetic fuels so very very educating and trusting before i hand over uh, for questions and answers to others, I'm going to ask uh, two small questions to both of you first for Conrad, because you are just finished. Uh, what I want to understand is uh, many people, analysts are saying that uh, for uh, directed energy weapons, uh, uh, you know, it may still be preferred in future to maybe have larger aircraft as fighters because uh, the combat is going to be longer range. Uh, there, there'll be weapons which are at much farther ranges. And uh, there will be uh, electronic warfare systems and direct energy weapons, which will require a great amount of uh, power on board. And therefore, maybe the future aeroplanes may be larger, closer to 
bomber size uh, aeroplane. So that's my question to Conrad. But before that, I'll ask a question to Julia so that both of you one by one can answer. Uh, now, uh, Julia, as uh, a part of the fourth industrial revolution, which you spoke at great length, you talked about the disruptive technologies as uh, Internet of Things, big data, 3D printing, cloud computing, etc., etc. And uh, then uh, what I want to know is that 3D printing, which is already a reality today, uh, there is a talk that uh, you know you could have uh, spares literally on call. Where exactly are we? Which, uh, uh, in your opinion, is uh, the various technologies uh, that you spoke about? Eight, ten of them uh, is going to affect the aviation most as per you. Uh, I'm including uh, cyber, uh, artificial intelligence, smart sensor simulation. Uh, some of the technologies you mentioned about. So, Conrad first. Thereafter, Julia. Thank you. Yeah, it's. Um... No one has a Did you want me to go for one thing is for sure? No, the contract is already answering. Yeah, 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 yeah the, carry on. Um, sure, the, the one, one thing's for sure um, there will be a future system. Um, the future airspace will not be dominated by just large vehicles. Um, similarly, we're not going to have a, an all unmanned. Uh, future uh, without any large uh, combat platform. Um, I think it's fair to say that we will see a, uh, a requirement for a, a large controlling uh, manned platform, if you like, that's orchestrating the battle space. So this would be a large aircraft which has on board the high level of electrical energy to provide electrical power. But that's really that aircraft and that, that man in the loop is coordinating all of the advanced loyal wingman and, and weapon systems that are interconnected with that big system. And we are already developing um, propulsion systems for these small UAVs and for these effectors that are still going to produce high levels of electrical energy. So even these advanced smaller UAVs um, that are potentially expendable would have a limited directed energy weapon capability, certainly to disrupt electrical systems. We don't have to have the future Star Wars laser damaging effects. But if you can have advanced UAVs, quite small, that have been controlled by the advanced manned combat platform that's sitting rearward out of harm's way, that can provide a disruptive um, capability through electrical energy um, that can be quite powerful. So it's, it's a combination of effects. Um, you are going to get these large directed energy weapons that are defensive as much as anything else uh, on, the, on the large man combat platform. And you will have a system of systems where you will launch in front of that aircraft smaller UAVs, loyal wingman, uh, missile systems. And these will be intelligent missile systems, not the cruise missiles of today. And they will also have electrical energy generation on those power systems that can provide directed, uh, directed energy effects, not necessarily weapons, but directed energy effects. So we are looking at a very diverse future. Nobody's got a crystal ball. One thing's for sure, we're not just looking at single large platforms, and we will have to have manned platforms in the loop because communications-wise, we have to limit communication so it can't be picked up externally. And the decision-making real-time has to be made with a man in the loop. Or, or a pilot, man or woman in the loop. So we will see where we go, but it will not be a simple future and uh, it will not be a simple answer. It will be a combination of effects. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to Juliana. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And, and just, I guess, on Conrad's response there, uh, uh, absolutely, we, we are in the space of multi domain operations, if you like, from space in that sort of layered ISR or information surveillance uh, reconnaissance kind of environment through to. The network of operational environment and access and assets within it, the ability to rapidly make decisions for information advantage will be and critical. And, and so the whole environment changes and therefore the way that we are changes. I guess for me, if I sort of break it down into sort of five areas, the area of sort of AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, 
computing simulation, if I could just bundle all of that together, that is crazy. Handle that uh, can handle kind of machines, the intelligence that we're now starting to see. You've then got that kind of another big group around the sort of sensing capability, uh, the sensors and the communications that goes with that sort of agile mesh networks, cognitive sensing capabilities, and the cyber environment that sort of gets wrapped around that. Again, in experiencing really significant changes. You've then got to consider there's a human in here somewhere. And technologies such as, you know, that we sort of see proliferating in the games environment, virtual reality, mixed reality, you know, they are here to stay and they're what we're using within our design and test environment. And if I just look at training, you know, we're working with the RAF to take down the amount of training from a sort of 50-50 live versus virtual into 80% virtual and synthetic, and only 20% is in the kind of expensive live environment. So that they're creating really different options. And then as, as Conrad said, you, you've then got the massive sort of technological advances that are taking place in the area of energy, power management, due, uh, net zero, you know, hypersonic kind of capabilities are in that space and then you're into how do you actually create these things how, how do you make systems of systems that can go from the large and complex to the attritable small scale agile to create that sort of combat mass and do it rapidly so there, there are just profound changes sweeping right the way through our sector changing not just what we put into the field, but how we operate with our customers, how we operate with our partners, the supply chain, and the sort of techniques that we're using to create and design systems. You asked a question about additive layer manufacturing and that kind of vision of the sort of um, support environment of the future where you can print parts on demand. That is absolutely part of that vision of an interconnected sort of ecosystem. So be, uh, aircraft on the ground is expensive. You want operational aircraft doing the thing that you've designed them to do as much of the time as possible. And so systems in which um, you take technology, the operational systems communicate in advance so that the support environment is ready them out into service as quickly as possible is part of that vision and technologies like blockchain are supporting how we have that really secure trust that goes from the operational asset through into the supply chain so it, it's 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 so profound some of the changes that that we're seeing through all aspects of the of the business and the industry it's difficult to prioritize one area of technology over any other yeah. Yeah. I hand over to Group Captain Chaudhary. Will you uh, kindly uh, ask the remaining questions on behalf of the others? I'll, I'll do that, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a question from Wing Commander Tiwari to Mr. Banks. He wants to know, is there any combat technology in the pipeline based on modular nuclear reactor based dungeons for air platforms? Mr. Banks, for you. Yeah, the... Um... The only application of nuclear for air we're looking at is actually in, in space applications. Um, we're not looking at nuclear uh, powered for uh, traditional air breathing. Um, it's at this stage, it's just too big a, uh, too big a jump from a, a safety logistic uh, and packaging point of view. Um, although you have wonderful power density with nuclear, actually the packaging of all of the systems is quite prohibitive uh, for a lot of platforms. Um, I'm not saying it will never happen because we are miniaturizing the nuclear capability very rapidly in Rolls-Royce. The whole concept of small nuclear reactors is that we can deploy, deploy them um, anywhere. These can be, you know, they're getting progressively smaller. And it's not inconceivable 
that we would look at nuclear propulsion in the future. Um, personally, I think it is an extremely long way off and potentially unlikely. It's certainly going to happen in space, and we have active programs looking at space propulsion, um, which provides huge benefits for power density. You know, at the moment, you have solar panels and all sorts of limited challenges with space propulsion and a limited amount of rocket fuel, etc. So yes, for space, it's being looked at already. Um, certainly in the next 30 to 50 years, no for other um, aerospace applications. But there are teams in Rolls-Royce looking at miniaturization. It is theoretically possible. There are safety challenges. They are, they are weight and packaging challenges. Who knows where industry will go? So I wouldn't rule it out, but you're not going to see the emergence of nuclear-powered uh, fighters uh, in the next uh, 30 or 50 years, no. Thank you, Mr. Banks. There's another question from uh, Wing Commander Tiwari, this time for uh, Professor Sutcliffe. He wants to know, in the order of priority, can you list the disruptive technologies achievable in the present on a chronological scale? Professor Sutcliffe, that's for you. <clears throat> I think it's um, it, it's quite a difficult one to answer in terms of a list of, of technologies in, in a sort of a chronological order. I guess those big chunks that I've identified, data simulation, then you've got sensing, then you've got sort of... Um, sort of energy power sort of environment that Conrad talked about and then the human sort of virtual reality sort of interfaces context. All of those have got technologies that are here right now that are creating profound changes and also technologies that are probably in the pipeline over the next 10 years and then some beyond that. But if I was to sort of pick one that is um, just so prevalent it, it, and there's so much talk about it at the moment it, it's probably in the area of, of you know artificial intelligence and what that is allowing us to do um right the way through our systems and through that life cycle from concept evaluation through to operation in the field it's pervasive and governments around the world prime ministers and um, nato are, sort of, are calling out sort of, artificial intelligence is such a key area in which we must cooperate and collaborate um, through the supply chain, through our partnerships with, with governments and industry alike. So I guess also that area of technology is probably enjoying more investment than any other because it's being fueled by you know, the, the tech giants, the Amazons, Googles, Alibaba, et cetera putting an enormous amount of investment in those technologies. So our challenge is how to how to pull them into our systems and our processes at the right point in time. Particularly uh, comprehensive answer. <clears throat> okay, um, there is another from uh, Group Captain Purohit. Again for you, Professor Sattrev. Uh, what he says is, while much has been spoken about the advantages of disruptive technologies, what are the likely disadvantages of these technologies uh, that we need to be careful about? I suppose following on from that point about AI, um, one of the key challenges for us is the issue of, of trust and of data provenance in that space. Um, so, in, in, you know, we're very, very used to within our sector of creating systems that have got high uh, safety requirements, security requirements, et cetera. Um, the industries and Rolls-Royce BA systems and, and um, our customer communities, we rely on being able to ensure that systems are safe and predictable in how they will operate. And so... Creating systems that can ingest vast amounts of, of data in order that somebody can make a decision at the right point in time to maintain that information advantage, particularly in this sort of battle space where you've got hypersonic 
type capabilities and, and such a small amount of time in order to make decisions, provenance of all of that data, trust in some of the algorithms and the software systems that are created is, is I think, a, a challenge we need to be able to get our heads around. Let me, okay. let me add, uh, let me add uh, uh, one or two sentences. You know, uh, as she very rightly mentioned, uh, I think both the speakers mentioned about uh, because uh, that's a key issue. But I also feel that, uh, you know, uh, over dependence on automation itself requires some checks and balances, which have yes. to be also brought out by another set of systems. So we have seen some of the airline crashes, whether it's the Air France cra crash in the Atlantic. You know, uh, everything was going honky dory. Uh, but uh, uh, for automation, there have to be some checks and balances, which can also be in the form of more systems. So uh, I thought I will just uh, add a little bit to that. Okay. Um, right, sir. And there is a question from VM Bahadur, again to Professor Sakri. He says that as per Moore's law, the computer power, the computing power of computer doubles every 18 odd months. That has changed now. What would be the rate of AI capability as per the present knowledge? Um, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I guess what I would say is in terms of scale, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of people working on AI around the globe. We've we've yeah. had statistics. So, for example, if I look at if I look in the city of and the number of startups that are AI startups, there are something like seven thousand AI startups just in in London. I'm sure in India with your um, fantastic capability in, in software. You are seeing the same kind of thing. Huge numbers of companies starting up utilizing AI. So I, I can't say as a comparison to a Moore's law sort of doubling in 18 months equivalent. I don't know what the answer to that would be, but it, it feels like just an, an explosion on a daily basis because of organizations that are dealing in this space. Kinds of investment going into into this area is is is, is I will. Um, uh, thank you. I think uh, that would provide some answer to. There is one more question from Forty Three Wing, and that is the last question that probably will take. The question is to Mr. Banks. Uh, the officer wants to know where does com quantum computing stand in terms of integration with the aerospace industry? Oh, that's a good question. And it's not a question I'm brilliantly placed to answer. I do know um, when I talk to our specialists within, within Rolls-Royce at the moment, this is a very significant growth area. Um, and it's something where organically within the company, we don't have much knowledge. So we are you know, recruiting a lot of experts in this field. It clearly has a, a key role. Um, how key that is, I'm not really in any place to answer. I mean, Julian might know a bit more about quantum computing, but um, it's clearly going to have have a role. Um, how significant that will be, only time will tell. But I, I can't provide more an answer than that, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, Professor Sutcliffe, any uh, views on it? Really, just to sort of back up what Conrad is saying there, in, in that, you know, computing, there are many different forms of computing that, that, that there is out there. There's neuromorphic computing, there's, you know, edge computing, quantum cloud computing, and then, you know, utilizing cloud and quantum computing is quite a tantalizing prospect. Uh, it certainly offers the opportunity to do things um, that are unthinkable in terms of calculation rates um, and and the applicate its application in the world of cyber and security is is also quite profound insofar as that level of computation would break the encryption systems that that we have today but interestingly quantum mechanics also offer a 
opportunity for a sort of an unbreakable cipher based on the laws of physics as opposed to mathematics. So it's a tantalising prospect. I, I don't think it is a long, long way away. I would expect quantum systems to start appearing for the next decade or, or so. And our organisation uh, won't be the developers of that capability, but will be integrators. So we're preparing ourselves for how to integrate this kind of technology into our systems. Uh, thank you, Professor Sutcliffe. Over to you, Chair, for your closing remarks, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Groupie Chaudhary, for coordinating the question and answer session. Great session, in fact. Uh, thanks to these two very, very learned speakers from two organizations who are doing the cutting-edge work uh, for the future. I recently wrote a book on China's aerospace, and the space was an important element in that. And I must mention that uh, I had to write a few paragraphs on uh, quantum computing because Chinese are, uh, 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 in addition to the Americans, are trying to push a lot in quantum computing, uh, especially when it comes to astronomy, to uh, comes to space systems, uh, comes to weather, uh, because uh, the way the imponderables are too many, the, the number of calculations required parallelly are one hell of a lot. I believe quantum computing is uh, going to help there, uh, but not uh, withstanding. Uh, you know, ours has been a session on uh, future technology, but I must tell you that we in India, we keep, uh, you know, connecting all the future technologies with our mythology in the past. Uh, and you, you know, some of you would have known, but I must tell you that uh, in our uh, uh, you know, epic uh, epics and uh, uh, ancient uh, scriptures. We have these flying platforms and palaces and chariots, you know, which, which used to fly, which can be akin to the unmanned uh, uh, flying uh, systems of today. There have been you know, hovercrafts which have been written off about uh, 10,000 uh, uh, to 1,500 years back. Uh, there's talk of stealth, mercury vortex engines in our mythological books. Uh, they, they have been talk about uh, weapons like Indra's Vajra, which is a lightning bolt, which is uh, somewhat akin to today's uh, uh, laser weapons. And the two uh, main uh, systems that uh, these two panelists spoke of today, Taranis, uh, Taranis uh, which uh, we have uh, uh, heard a lot about, is uh, uh, means uh, God of Thunder. And the second word we heard today was a tempest, which means uh, a violent storm. So uh, just a sideline to Indian mythology, uh, but um, as far as technology is concerned, uh, at the recently completed Aero India, we saw many unmanned platforms, manned and uh, unmanned teaming being uh, showcased. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, India is looking for joining with leading uh, companies elsewhere to acquire and develop together new technologies. Engines and unmanned platforms are among the two which are of uh, uh, greater interest. And these are the two which were spoken of by the two speakers today. The uh, aerospace industry accounts for nearly 40% of the global uh, military expenditure as per CIPRI's uh, report last year. So uh, most successful countries like uh, USA, UK, European Union, China, Russia, they're allotting huge sums of R&D uh, money for the uh, aerospace technologies. Uh, India is uh, geopolitically located at where all the action is uh, developing uh, in the times to come, Indo-Pacific. Uh, uh, it does have industrial base. It has great potential to absorb new technologies. And therefore, uh, you know, both the speakers spoke about uh, the need to do some work jointly. Uh, India must identify uh, critical technologies uh, what I call them as uh, low hanging fruits uh, so that we can grab them first so that thereafter we can uh, leap forward. Uh, in Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, HAL, it is a great licensed uh, production house, uh, but still has not exploited R&D sufficiently. Uh, I think India needs to spend a little more uh, money on uh, research and development, uh, especially defense. Because in the Atam Nirbhata plan that India is trying to push, uh, R&D uh, spend has to certainly uh, you know, go up. Uh, India today has many programs. We all know about the LCA variants. We know the AMCA. We know the light and medium uh, uh, helicopters that we are working on, large number of them. 
Uh, we are also looking at small uh, transport aircraft, but UAV has been the flavor of the season uh, in uh, uh, other than the ALCA during Aero India. Now, uh, India has uh, recently started uh, uh, clearing, of course, some weapons even for export. We have done well in uh, the missile system, whether it's uh, Brahmos, uh, Akash air defense system, even our LCS, uh, you know, competing for exports. Many companies are uh, today also wanting to uh, invest in India. We, we know both uh, BAE Systems, Rolls-Royce, Lockheed Martin, Boeing. They are in big way. We are already making uh, 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 aircraft structures, uh, whether it's for C-130, whether it's for various helicopters. Uh, we are making the cabins. We are making fighter aircraft wings within the country. And that means India is getting all set to absorb the uh, new technologies. The fifth generation aircraft will require even more new technologies, some of which have been spoken of uh, this evening. Uh, what I'm very happy about is that the private industry has uh, great potential and they have started having a uh, uh, lot of tie-ups and they are also uh, right now manufacturing a lot of uh, things for foreign uh, you know, customers uh, made in India, but they are high technology uh, you know, items. And uh, the overseas companies, which were till now looking at Indian industries uh, uh, as a partners, uh, basically only for software and cheap manufacturing, have also changed their mind about, uh, uh, you know, India. And we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, equal kind of partnerships that are evolving, whether it's uh, in software with Infosys, Tata, consultancies, HCL, Wipro, Infotech, etc. But the one great thing which I want to about India is that uh, unlike many other countries, India is uh, it respects uh, intellectual property rights. Now that is a very very big plus for India. Uh, and uh, among the new aviation technologies that uh, have been spoken of today, and India needs to leap ahead. Uh, and including our uh, uh, Prime Minister has spoken about is the artificial intelligence for automation, additive 3D manufacturing with uh, spares on call hypersonic platforms and weapons, uh, integrated electronic warfare and net-centric warfare environment, uh, integrated communications, navigation and identification, CNI, which we have been reading about for some time. Uh, another area we are working on, re like rest of the world, is small satellites, uh, unmanned platforms and swarming. Uh, as far as engines are concerned, uh, we did not talk about it today, but uh, we know these uh, gentlemen uh, on our panel, they know very well that uh, Aircraft engine technologies, including adaptive or style engine technology, thrust vectoring, super cruise, uh, are very, very, uh, you know, important areas for uh, India to master. And of course, now uh, electric uh, propulsion, which has been spoken of at great length. Uh, there's a mention about uh, laser and directed uh, energy weapons. Now, these weapons, they were spoken of only in terms of the overall power requirement. But uh, for us uh, people who are in the game, uh, in the Air Force, the men in blue uh, and women in blue, uh, they would want to have a high off board sight uh, missiles uh, for rare hemisphere kills. We want uh, missiles which have lower cost per kill. So th these are some of the technologies of interest to India. Uh, another area is the ISA uh, radar with the high bandwidth, uh, low probability of intercept. Uh, and uh, uh, even if it means using new uh, materials like these, semiconductor materials such as uh, gallium uh, nitride. Uh, we also uh, need to uh, do more on the infrared search and track systems. Uh, and of course, uh, all this will require high speed uh, data buzzes. Uh, another area which was not part of our uh, panel's discussion this uh, evening, but the centralized vehicle health monitoring is uh, indirectly came out uh, during discussions. Uh, there has to be uh, inbuilt uh, multispectral uh, stealth uh, uh, development. It's not just uh, uh, you know stealth in terms of uh, 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 you know uh, uh, body shaping or materials, but uh, also in terms of noise and IR and various various uh, other spectrums. Uh, the passive air, air elastic tailored wings are being talked of. They're going to be lighter. They're going to use better materials. They're going to be structurally more efficient, aerodynamically more efficient. Uh, we need uh, system integrations for first look, first shoot, first kill capability. Uh, and uh, we are very happy that uh, in many of these areas, uh, uh, the Rolls-Royce and BAE 
are uh, you know moving ahead with their new programs whether it's the tempest taranis and uh, there's great uh, potential for future for both these companies to work with us in india on new technologies it was indeed uh, a great session uh, i must uh, thank julia and conrad for uh, all the way from uk uh, uh, joining us here and i understand both of you have been coming to india for every uh, every year for an event like this uh, may i now uh, uh, request uh, each one of you in your own uh, little way uh, kindly clap for julia and conrad thank you caps for inviting us and over to caps thank you chair thank you. and the panel for a very informative discussion on aerospace technology uh, may i now request air vice marshal manmohan bahadur vm additional director general caps uh, additional director caps to kindly deliver his closing remarks uh, ladies and gentlemen i promise you that i will close in 3 minutes i just want to reemphasize uh one point that the chief brought up in his talk he said and if i got him right uh we have to be ready to refine and redefine our plans as things and events change around us unquote that is the crux of an agile mind an inquisitive mind and a mind that has all its antenna up and quivering our neighbors are modernizing at a fast pace and so are we rather so should we but we need to be ahead of them for sure and in this endeavor let me assure you that it would be air power that would lead the way we need to learn from our legacy but for that we must first record it for future generation and the recording must be true and factual we must be open to new ideas and new entrants in the game of war give them their due as they have a significant role to play in the success of indian air power and finally technology uh, there is a famous uh, saying that goes time and tide wait for no man we have read that in school uh, may i add an, uh, another t to that and say time time and technology wait for no man we can afford to fall back but at our own peril we at caps requested the commands air force commands to let all those who can be spared to attend this conference the response has been wonderful almost 100 plus air force stations have attended this conference but to all the air warriors who have listened to us watch the experts i say don't ever stop learning while the internet is a good source of information there is no substitute for a book go to the station libraries and read up all that you can you can log on to our website capsindia.org for reading all our journals publications and you can write to us anytime anywhere at the end i would be remiss if i do not thank all the panelists our chairpersons who accepted our invitation to come and talk as also the tremendous work of a team of dedicated personnel at caps behind the scenes who made this seminar possible to all of them thank you very much till the next time and may i request now everybody unmute and clap for each other for attending this thank you jai hind Thank you very much for joining. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.